This morning, I want to look about leaving a legacy. I know that when I tell you to think about the future, some of you guys have a hard time thinking about anything even past lunch this morning. I want to challenge you to do something you probably haven't done in a long time, or might you, something you might have never done. I want you to think about your funeral. I want you to think about the day that you're going to die. I want you to challenge you to live your life backwards from that day. What kind of impact do you want to have on the people around you? What kind of impact do you want to have on the people that look up to you, the people that know you, the people that come alongside of you? As a follower of Jesus, what kind of impact are you leaving for the people that are left, especially when it comes to the next generation? What do you live for? Would it be what Jesus wanted you to live for? The reason that he died to save you, to redeem you, does that completely alter your desires, your passions? Does that, or are you... Or is this all about you, your pursuits, your ideas, your affections? Would your impact be felt and passed on to others, those who are standing around your cold, dead body in the casket? Or will their lives never be changed or different because you are in their lives? Will there be something left behind? You need to understand the question is not whether you're going to leave an impact or not. The question is not whether you're going to leave a legacy or not. You are going to leave a legacy. You are going to leave an impact. The question is what kind of impact, what kind of legacy are you going to leave? This morning, my challenge is to call you to live for something greater than yourself. I will call you this morning to live for the glory of Jesus and live in such a way that the Jesus that you serve will be desired by those around you, especially the children that God puts in your life. It doesn't matter if they are your kids or they're the kids of someone else in this church. It doesn't matter if you're single, married, want kids, or you're scared of kids. Your call is to live your life in such a way that you point the next generation to Jesus. If you're part of our church community, then the children that are part of this church are just as much as your responsibility as it is the parents of these children. You should be a positive impact upon them and upon their lives. Again, you have an impact. You do. You leave a legacy, whether you realize it or not. These little children in our church look up to you. They watch you. They try to emulate you. They try to be like you. I remember when Tim was two, and he started falling in love with the drums. We, um, all of a sudden, he wanted to change his name to Jonathan. And I was like, oh, Lord, please help. Um, and because he loved the way Jonathan played the drums. And he would sit on the front row with me, and he, all he would do was watch Jonathan play the drums. He could, he could, you could do anything. He was, eyes would not get distracted off of him. It took a lot of praying, a lot of fasting for him to get his name back to Tim. Um, so we praise God for that. But our kids watch you. Our kids look up to you. You've heard the statement that it takes a village to raise a child. It's an old African proverb, but the concept is taken out of the Bible. It takes a community, a church, to raise a child. The passage that we're going to look at this morning is a passage in Deuteronomy 6. Moses is addressing the people of God who are standing at the border of the promised land. They're about to go over, and they need to be reminded how they're supposed to function there. They need to be reminded that they are a covenant community, and as a family, they need each other corporately together to serve God, love, and advance the mission that God has placed before them. When you look at this passage, you need to understand that Moses is not speaking to a single family unit. He's not talking to one family, pulling them aside and saying, here's what I want you to do. He calls the entire nation, the entire community together, and says, this is what I'm calling you to do. This is what I'm calling you to do collectively. This involves all of you, whether you have children or not. This is the legacy that I want you to leave. Some of you guys who don't have children or are not married, you'll immediately try to zone me out this morning. But let me encourage you not to do that. Because everything that I talk about this morning applies to discipleship, applies to relationships, to friendships that you have. Everything that I talk about in terms of parents raising their children can be applied to the lives of people that God has brought into your life. The relationship that a parent has with a child is the same for others around you. 
We all need to be involved in discipleship. We all need to be involved in leaving a legacy, passing what we know about Jesus, the experience that we have with Jesus, the mission that we are on for Jesus. This needs to be passed on to people around us. Every single person here should be involved in having an impact and influence on those around you. The text is a sad text when you think about the context. The oldest person in this crowd is no more than 40, with the exception of Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. There are only three guys over 40. 600,000 people had left Egypt wandering in the desert. That number has shrunk. Everyone over 40 is dead and gone because of their disobedience. God killed them in the desert. All their parents and grandparents have died in the wilderness. They refused to obey God. They complained. They bickered. They wanted to go back to Egypt where they came from. So you can imagine there's not much of a legacy that's left here. These guys are left to start over as a new generation. The legacy that has been left to them is that they've learned how to doubt God, how to mock God, how to complain about God. This is what they learned from their families. Life was hard for these guys. They struggled with people walking away from God, especially their parents. They struggled with wondering where food would come from, where water would come from, wondered where they were going in life. They didn't know what they were doing. They were literally circling in the desert over and over. Their families were dying off. Everyone is complaining about God. They were the only ones left, and they were young. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound like the context that we're in? They knew that God had promised them a good land ahead of them, but they found it hard to believe to hold on to the promise as if it were true. All their parents have died in the wilderness. And the question posed before them is, why shouldn't they be different from their parents? Why shouldn't they just continue in the same ways that their parents lived? Why should they change? The question is, would they love God, keep his commandments, follow him, even though their parents didn't? Would they be faithful? Would they teach their children about this faithfulness? Would they unite as a community and support one another in this pursuit? Would they spread God's fame in this new land that they were going into? Would they live their life on mission for the glory of God's name? Or would they live in isolation away from the world? They were about to embark into a dangerous territory, a dangerous country, a dangerous journey into a culture that was completely opposed to the gospel, completely opposed to God. A culture that wants to consume them, conform them to be just like them. The gospel is at stake here. God's glory is at stake here. Everything is at stake here. This is very important. The same is true of us as parents. The same is true of us as a church. What does it mean to leave a legacy for Jesus? What's it mean to leave an impact to the next generation where they will love Jesus, follow Jesus, serve Jesus more than we do all? Let me give you six things from our text. Number one, be faithful. Be faithful. Verse 1. This is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land in which you are going over to possess it. Right at the beginning of the speech, Moses tells them to do exactly what your parents never did. That was to obey Jesus. Not just talk about it, not just play a good game, but to actually do it. He says, these are the commandments that you are supposed to do. These are not simply commandments that you're supposed to listen to. These are not commandments that you're simply supposed to believe. These are not commandments that you're simply supposed to know. These are, supposed, these are commandments that you are supposed to be taught so that you can practice it and you can do it in your life. This was the goal of Moses' teaching. Not just so people can know what they believe, but they can practice that truth and be faithful in obedience to that truth. What's Moses trying to do? He's trying to guard them from hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was the name of the game for their parents' generation. They all claimed to know and love Jesus. They all claimed to follow Jesus. Yet all they did was bicker and complain and whine and mock God. What they believed and how they lived were completely antithetical to each other. Moses wanted to guard them from hypocrisy. He's challenging them to live out what they believe. Listen, nothing ruins the next generation. Nothing ruins the effect of your witness. Nothing ruins the impact that you will have on your life of your children more than hypocrisy. Nothing. 
If you are living one way and you claim to believe something completely different, it will affect your children. To say that you live one way, come to church and act like you have everything all together and then to go off and completely live in a completely different way, your children are watching and they will see it. Just so you know, Jesus saved his harshest critics, criticism for the religious hypocrites. Paul saved his strongest words for the so-called brother, people that weren't really followers of Jesus, but they put on a show in front of everyone else just so they could be accepted. Some of you in this room, you need to examine yourself. You sing to Jesus. You raise your hands. You take communion. You talk a good game. But let's be honest, you're full of it. You may have a lot of us fooled. You may act like you have everything together. You know the right words to say. But God knows exactly what you're doing. God knows your heart. I want to go to the extent of saying that when you do that, you're actually making a mockery of the gospel. Because you show up at church and live one way, but then you live a completely different way when you step out of the doors of this building. And God sees it. Do you, under, do you understand that if you're going to live like a hypocrite, you're actually going to ruin the mission of the gospel that he's calling us to do? It's much better for you not to play the game at all. Listen, we've got a pretty open community here. You can be as honest and open as you want. We've created an environment where you can be honest with your struggles and weaknesses, and you don't get judged here, but you'll be welcomed, you'll be accepted, you'll be challenged to keep pursuing God. We won't let you stay in your sin, but we will challenge you, but we will love you and accept you. Listen, we're all broken people, and we'll be happy to admit that. So listen, be free to be honest. Don't play a game. Don't pretend that you have everything okay when you don't. Contrary to popular opinion and liberal theology, you can't pick and choose which laws of God you want to accept and which laws of God is not relevant to you. You can't say that you will do good deeds and then go sleep around with anyone that you want. You can't give your tithes and then be looking at pornography when your wife and your children are asleep. You can't raise your hands in worship and then abuse your wife physically, verbally, or emotionally. You either follow Jesus completely or you don't. You either recognize you have a problem and you get help for that problem and admit that you are broken and in need of God's grace and you have sin in your life, or you hide your sin from everyone else and live a double life. And the Bible calls that hypocrisy. When you pick and choose what you want about Jesus, when you pick and choose what you obey about Jesus, as if he's some kind of buffet line that you can choose what you want and ignore the others, you've created your own little Jesus. And it's not the real Jesus. It's one you made up. And you made up a Jesus that's cute and cuddly and allows you to continue in sin and doesn't confront you, doesn't challenge you, doesn't force you to confront your sin, one that never offends you. The Jesus that you have is not the Jesus of the Bible. And the Jesus that you claim to follow of the Bible, is the Jesus that you claim the Jesus of the Bible? Or is he one that you just made up? Because if you're comfortable and good in your sin, and he lets you live any way that you want, it's probably not the biblical Jesus. Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, follow me. Alan talked about this in the middle of worship. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. That's not pretty. It's not a pretty picture. That's not a pretty calling. He says, if you want to follow me, great. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. It's not a piece of jewelry that you wear around your neck. It's a bloody, gruesome symbol of death and anguish. Jesus is saying, you want to follow me? Good. Die to yourself. You want to follow me? Stop living for yourself. Listen to what I tell you. Obey it. Do it. And then follow me. In our passage, in the back of the mind of these guys that are standing there, the memory of their moms and dads cursing God, bickering, complaining, but smiling every weekend when they went to church, smiling when they went in front of the tabernacle, smiling when they made their sacrifices, no doubt, this is what the entire generation saw. 
You can imagine the bitterness that they had, dancing, celebrating, praising in church when, they, when it was time for offerings. But as soon as they get home, bickering, yelling, cursing, complaining. They know what it's like not to follow Jesus. They've seen hypocrisy their entire life. And here's Moses calling them not to follow the way their parents behaved, but to create a new legacy, a new way of living for their children. I want you to notice at the end of verse 1, he provides them hope. He gives them hope there. He says, to go, you're about to go into the land that you're going to go over to possess it. You've got to understand, this community saw their entire previous generation die in the wilderness. And to hear these words are words of tremendous hope. We're not going to die in the wilderness. God says, you are going to go and possess it. He assures them, you're going to go over. I've got a plan for you. I will use you. I will work through you. This is what God is telling him. He will be faithful to his word, and he will guide them. Paul picks up on this in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. And here's what he says in verse 1. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud. They passed through the sea. And they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You see what Paul's saying here? He's saying that before you get prideful and say, oh, it's those guys. They're screwed up. They're messed up. They're jacked up. They don't follow God. Before you do that, be careful. Take heed, lest you fall. When you see God's judgment on these people, when you see God disciplining these people, make sure that there is a deep sense of humility in your own life because you're not any different. Matter of fact, I deserve the same condemnation. But then Paul says this in the next verse. He says, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to men. Everything you go through, the struggles that you have, the fight that you have with sin, it's not unique to you. You need to realize that this morning. Some of you feel very unique. Some of you feel like the things that you're going through are very unique, that no one else goes through it, as if you're the only one going through it, but you're not. It's common to men. And notice Paul's words as he closes. He says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, flee from idolatry. He provides hope. Moses in his passage provides hope. Paul provides hope in the midst of hopelessness. St. Augustine once said, command what you wish, but give what you command. God, command whatever you want. I'm a follower of you. I'll do whatever you say, but please give me what you command. Give me grace to follow through with what you've told me to do. He will not abandon you to yourself. Some of you think you're alone in this. But he says very clearly in Scripture, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll always be with you. Some of you need to hear that this morning. This is God speaking to you this morning. I will not leave you. If you are in Jesus, God is saying he will not abandon you in the midst of your struggles. He will not abandon you in the midst of your suffering. I will be with you. You say, I failed. Yeah, I'm supposed to be faithful, but I haven't been. I failed, and I haven't just failed once, but I failed over and over. To this, Paul reminds us, if we are faithless, God remains faithful. Even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. Isn't that good to hear this morning? Because the call to be faithful, we all fail. The call to be like Jesus, we all fail. 
the call to honor him in everything that we do, we all screw up. We have ups, we have downs. But this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. He wants long obedience in the same direction. Those of you who are parents, when you think about what it means to be a father, when you think about what it means to be a mother, think long term with your children. Remember they're watching you. They will derive what it looks like to follow Jesus from you. Those of you who are single, how are you living your life now where people look at you and they see Jesus in you? Second thing, be worshipful. Moses introduces it in that same passage when he says that you may fear the Lord your God. Fear. Fear in God. It's not a cowering, crippling type of fear. Oh God, please don't kill me. Please don't judge me. Please don't strike me down. It's not that kind of fear. It's rather a fear that's full of awe, full of wonder, full of respect for God. When it comes to the Bible, explaining the fear of God is a hard thing to do. It's not just cowering, afraid of God type of fear. But at the same time, it's much more deeper than just respecting God. So you can't translate it, just respect God. Because there's something to the emotional side, to the affection side of it as well. So we translate it the fear of God, simply so we can understand it. The best way to describe it is if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls, you might be, when you get there, at least for one moment, you forget about yourself. The moment you look over the cliff and see the beauty of God's creation, the moment you look and see the beauty of the falls and the power of the falls, you forget about yourself. You forget about your, everything about you. You forget your problems, your struggles, your future, your past. For a moment, you're lost in the greatness of what's before you. The moment you see it, you're not continuing the conversation that you previously had. The moment you see it, you're, you stop. You're in awe of what's in front of you. You're not standing there talking about yourself and your accomplishments. You're lost in something that's greater than you can ever imagine. There's even a hush that falls on you just for a moment. Maybe the only words that come out of your mouth is, wow. You get quiet, and you just take in the greatness of the whole thing. You feel small. See, that's a little bit of seeing what the fear of God is. The closer you get, the more in awe you are. The closer you get to the edge, you look down, there's a little bit of fear that comes upon you. But in that smallness, don't we feel good? Doesn't it feel good to stand and be there? We feel small, but we feel good about it. It's a strange feeling. This is kind of what it means to fear God. We don't feel empty necessarily, but we feel like we're drawn into fullness, into something so much bigger. That's what we call worship. That's what we do every Sunday. That's what we're called to do with our lives. That's what we call the fear of God. Everyone feels this. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls. You feel it maybe when you go to a concert or a game. You get lost in the feeling of the event. The fear of God is when you, feel, when you become less important, others and what they think about you become less important, and Jesus and what he says about you becomes more important. You get lost in that greatness. That's what it means to fear God. See, the gospel is essential for this. Your life is either spent in the fear of God, trying to honor God with your life, or in the fear of man, trying to honor people and get their approval. What category you fall under depends on how much you believe the gospel in your life. Practically speaking, one of the greatest ways to demonstrate the fear of God in our life and in the lives of people around us it's through the confession of our own sin. It's to be honest with one another. It really shows an element of our fear of God, not the fear of man. Because the fear of man, all you want to do is make yourself look good in front of other people. You don't want to be honest. You don't want to be transparent. You don't want people to think negative of you. But when you fear God, you really don't care much about what other people think anymore. But you be honest and say, listen, you might think negative of me, but I need to tell you this because I need your help. I need you to pray for me. I'm struggling right now. I need God's grace. I don't want to be struggling in this sin. Would you pray for me? 
I got stuff going on and I need hope, I need prayer. That demonstrates a true fear of God because you're not living just for the approval of people, but you're wanting to honor God with your life. You need a deep sense of who Jesus is, who we are in light of his greatness. We need to know our place and joyfully embrace that. Parents, your kids need to see the fear of God in your life. They need to sense the honor of Jesus from you. Let me ask you, who do you worship functionally? I'm not asking who you declare to worship, but who has value in your life? Who changes your life? When's the last time you actually changed something in your life because you feared God? Because he was so great, so awesome, that you were drawn to him and your immediate response was, I'm a mess. I need to change because you saw how great he is. You see, the closer you get to him, the closer the light shines on you, the more you see, the less you are in terms of following him, how less you're loving him, and the more you want to change. And as the light shines brighter, the more you realize how sinful you are and that there's a desire in you to change because of Jesus. Some of you aren't close enough to Jesus so you don't see anything at all. You're so far in the dark that there's no light shining in your life. So you never change. You continue in sin. It doesn't bother you. You don't think there's anything wrong in your life. How close are you to Jesus? When have we been last captured by his greatness, by his wonder? Number three, be knowledgeable. I might not have time to finish all six. Well, if not, we'll finish next week. But number three, be knowledgeable. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The point here is that God is unified in his will and purpose. God isn't dysfunctional. He isn't inconsistent. We believe in only one God. We believe that he's not one among many gods. We believe he's the only God that exists. There is no other God out there. There are so many so-called gods, but there aren't any other gods. He's unique. He's one of a kind. He's precious. Jesus is incomparable to anything and anyone else. There's so many other gods out there that you're going to hear about in this new land that you're about to go into Israel, that you're about to possess, but they're not even comparable to your God. The psalmist captures this when he writes, You have multiplied, O Lord, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare to you. I will proclaim, I will tell of them, yet they are more than to be told. Notice again in this passage, it is the Lord our God. It's not the Lord your God. It's the Lord our God. It's not this Western idea of being individual in your faith. It's talking about the community as a whole. Everyone is supposed to learn together, to be advancing in their understanding of Jesus together for the sake of the next generation. Doctrine is absolutely important for you to know especially for the sake of the gospel, especially for the sake of the next generation. And I know some of you have been burned by people that push doctrine on you, and so you turn away from it. But listen, you need to know what you believe because your kids will ask you questions. How will your children know about Jesus and know Jesus unless it's passed on to them? How will young believers that are sitting around you know Jesus, follow Jesus, unless it's passed on to them? If you think that it all depends on me and all the other people that, that we teach, that teach up here, listen, that's not the way it works. They will ask you the questions. They'll look at you for answers. You need to know that you're the one that's called to pass it on to them. You need to know enough about Jesus in your mind that you can pass it on to your next generation. It's important. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in it, for by doing so you will save yourself and your hearers. Your children are hearing you. Watch your doctrine. Watch. Be careful about what you know about God. Moses wants the people to be consistently working in their knowledge about God. A.W. Tozer said, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the thing that's most important about you. So the question is, what are you learning about God? What are you teaching others about God? How are you teaching your children about God? Some of you are content with having this superficial, mystical Jesus idea. You know he loved you. You know he died for you. But that's the extent of it. That's about as deep as you go. And listen, it's okay to start there because that's profound right there. But you can't stick there. 
You can't stay there. You need a Jesus that confronts you. You need a Jesus that does not allow you to stay the way you are. Some of you have this misconstrued idea of grace that you think that Jesus turns a blind eye to you when you sin. That is not Jesus. He doesn't turn the blind eye. He wants you to deal with it. He needs a Jesus that says, look, son, I love you. You're my child, but I'm not going to let you live the way you live because I care about you and I care about your children too much to let you destroy your life. God is dead serious about your relationship with him because not just your life depends on it, but the life of your children and your children's children depends on it. The idea that we have this individual religion, me, my relationship, my walk with God, the Bible blows that out of the water. It's not by yourself. It's not about you and your little experience with Jesus. It's deeper than that. It's, about, it's much more profound than that. Your impact is upon those around you especially those little children that run around here after service. Number three, be joyful. Verse five, I believe, says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Not sure if you realize this, but do you know that Deuteronomy talks more about loving Jesus and loving God more than any other book of the Bible except the book of Psalms? It's not just a book about laws and rules and things we're supposed to do and not do. A key verse of the Bible is this one. Jesus says himself in the New Testament, this is the greatest commandment. It's funny when Jesus talks about commandments, the first commandment is not things that you're supposed to do of how things you're supposed to do and not do. The first commandment is love God. Love him. Be joyful. To leave a legacy, you need to pass on a love for God. He says here you're supposed to love him with all of your heart, your soul, your might. He's saying that you need to love God with everything that you are. Your heart, your mind, your will, your affections, your body, everything about you. Love me with that. Love me. Value me. Treasure me. Let me be the joy of your life. Listen, Jesus didn't go to the cross and die a brutal death just so that you can love him with your mind just so that you know that he did something for you. Some of you love him well with your mind. You know a lot about him, but that's about it. You need to love him more than just with your mind. You need to love him with your entire being, your affections, your heart, everything. He's going after your affections here. He doesn't want a bunch of soldiers who follow the orders of their general, but then go back to their barracks and complain about how mean and how hard he is. He wants a bunch of sons and daughters that says, Daddy, I love you. I worship you. I'll do whatever you tell me to do because I'm in love with you. The foundation to obeying God is this. To love God, to desire God, to want God, to treasure God, is to keep obeying God away from becoming duty or emotionless religious duty. One of the most misunderstood verses of the Bible is Jesus' comments in the book of John. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's not saying, if you want to show me how much you love me, do the things I tell you to do. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you love me, stop right there and address that issue first. Do you love me? Because the evidence of the fact that you love me is that you'll do what I tell you to do. When you love me, when I overwhelm your life, when, my, when your emotions are taken over by me, when you are drawn to me, the result of that is that you're going to obey my commandments. It will come right out of you. You will want to obey me. You will want to follow me. This is where it starts. He wants obedience that is induced by joy. Let me ask you, are you leaving a legacy of joy? Do people... Do children know you as someone who passionately pursues Jesus, who loves Jesus with fire in your bones, who loves his word because when you get into the word, you get to see Jesus? Going back to the illustration of the Grand Canyon, the whole point of the Bible is not to fill your head simply with knowledge, but it's a, like a map that guides you, that shows you which way to go so that when you get, it's guiding you toward the Grand Canyon. So that when you get there, you step out and you're in awe and wonder. It's not simply so you know which way to go. It's simply so that you could reach your destination, which is God. And you could be in awe and wonder. Are you full of joy? Are you full of happiness? Or do people around you know you as someone that comes to church, who claims to be a Christian, who goes through the motions, who loves to argue theology and doctrine? Is that what they know about you? 
Is that all that they know about you? Do they know you for your affection? Do they know you for your passion for Jesus? How do they know you? Do they know you as someone who's religiously astute, who knows everything? Or do they they know you because they see Jesus in your life? Do your children see you as a disciplinarian who's just trying to fix them? Or when they see you, do they see Jesus in your life? Do they see his love, his joy? Listen, we're not talking about being fake plastic smile that doesn't take into reality the situations of life. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not superficial happiness. It's not, oh, bless Jesus, God is good. My life is a mess. Oh, praise Jesus anyway. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's this deep-seated conviction that Jesus is on his throne and that he loves you no matter what you go through. No matter what you go through, deep inside you know God is in control of my life. It may be, there may be tears flowing out of your eyes. They may be, your heart may be breaking, but deep down inside, you know he's sovereign. You know he's in control. You know he has the best for your life. And you still communicate that even if you're suffering. That's what it means to rejoice in God at all times. Listen, some of you go through a lot of suffering. You go through a lot of anguish. Matt Chandler said this, and I love it. It says, some of you, God has ordained you simply to have crap beaten out of you all the time, over and over and over. And that's all you'll ever experience. You'll experience one suffering from the next suffering, one trial to the next trial. Because, listen, your best life is not now. Your best life is a life that's yet to come. And God will use the things that you go through. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, we're treated as imposters and yet are true. We're treated as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Paul's saying, listen, I'm always in tears. I'm always broken. Life is always a mess. But listen, in the midst of that, I will still praise him and worship him. These two come together in the Christian life, and it doesn't make any sense to a watching world. How can you be joyful in sorrow? The only way you can do it is having a changed heart by Jesus. Do people see you rejoicing in the midst of your suffering? Do they see you trusting God in the midst of your tears? Do they see you suffer and suffer well? This isn't about faking. This is about being real and being honest. Number five, be available. Verse five, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk in the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. The idea of teaching them diligently is the idea of impressing on them. The idea is the image of someone who's creating a monument. He takes a hammer and a chisel and pounds away and pounds away, chisels and chisels till the rock is formed into something. That's the idea of the word here. You keep going. You keep impressing the truth. You keep teaching. You keep pouring into them. You keep doing that because you are forming them. The whole idea of sitting, walking, lying down, rising. The idea is that everything you do your entire life, everywhere you go should be about Jesus. Both formally, when you sit down with your children and read them the tr- truths from Scripture, when you teach them Bible stories, but informally, as you go through life and they ask you questions, you teach them about Jesus in everything that you do. When they ask you questions, then listen, children will ask you questions. You point them to Jesus. Do you realize that your kids learn more about you, more about Jesus in the experiences of life than they do by sitting in the context of a church? It's not what they learn here in church that impresses their heart the most. It's what they learn about how you respond in the context of life and life situations. As you experience life together, more than just when you sit and read them the Bible in the evening, it's through the experiences of life and how you point them to Jesus, that's how they learn about them. This implies something very important here that you need to understand. If you're going to leave a legacy for Jesus, If you're going to disciple people around you, those of you who are single, you actually have to be with them. you got to be in their lives. This is where impact happens. 
It's not in a classroom setting. It's not sitting in a sanctuary once a week and just hearing truths taught to you. It's more than that. It's about sharing life together. It's important that you're around each other. It's in the context that you get called out on your sin. It's in this context that you get encouraged when you suffer. It's in this context that you do your mission together. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, some people take this very literally, especially some of our parents, and they have verses written all over their house. They just look at, go in their house, and there's verses everywhere. I don't think that's what Moses was talking about here. He's saying that scripture should govern your home, it should govern your mind, it should govern your hands. In other words, where you are, what you're thinking, what you're doing should be influenced by the truth of God's word. God says to impress on them, talk about them, tie them, write them individually on your own hands, as a family on the doorposts of your house, and in your city on the gates of the city. Listen, this mandate is not just for you, but it's to touch the city that God has placed you in, in every facet of your life. Bottom line, God wants you to be together, share life together with his word as a central focus. Let me ask you something. Is it common for you to be around other people and have Jesus come up in the conversation? Or is it just uncomfortable and awkward? I'm not talking about when you're hanging out with me, because some of you guys like to throw God into a conversation just because you think that's what you need to do with me. But when you're hanging out with other people, when you're hanging out with your friends, is it awkward for you to talk about what God's doing in your life? Is it awkward for you to say, hey, here's what God has blessed me with. Here's the way God has provided for me. Here's what God is doing. I'm talking about when you're home with your wife. Can you talk to her about, hey, what's God doing out of our family? When you're with your kids, can you talk to them about Jesus? I'm talking about when you're with your kids. Is it weird for you to bring Jesus into the conversation? If it is, you need to repent. I'm, listen, I'm not talking about some of those religious fanatics where everywhere they go, it's Jesus, 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 and a conversation about sports turns into about Jesus. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. We've seen some of those people. They're nuts. That's not what I'm calling you to be. But can you, in the context of your conversations, be able to talk about Jesus in a, in a normal way? Is he, are you able to talk about him? Number six, I went way over. Number six, be humble. Go all the way down to verse 20. He says some very interesting stuff here. He comes back to the children, back to the next generation. He says, when your son asks you in the time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statues and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Moses wants them to understand there's something more important here than just yourself. Life is more than just about you. He understands that if the parents, if the church is doing their job right, children will begin to ask questions. Young people will begin to ask questions. God gave them the ability to ask questions. It's a good thing. Listen to them. They're curious and they want to know everything. Be ready for it. I don't have time to get into verse 21, but basically he says that when your children start asking questions, I want you to tell them stories. I want you to talk about God. And the story that we have here is a beautiful story. When you tell stories, tell them about Jesus. The reference here, this story here references the grace of God, the salvation of God. They were enslaved, but God redeemed them. It talks about God's power, God's grace, God's faithfulness. These are all of these things are in this story about how God redeemed them from Egypt. He's saying, guys, remember when you go to the promised land and your children ask you questions about what happened, tell them about God. Tell them stories about God. Make sure that it's centered on grace. And make sure it's centered on Jesus. Tell them stories. Kids love stories. Adults love stories. That's why we go to movies all the time. But what kind of stories are you telling? Our stories should be stories of redemption, stories of grace coming out of our lives. Do you remember the story of the 12 spies? God, Moses sends them into Israel and says, spy out the land. Come back and tell me what you see. Ten of them come back and they have a story to share. They tell about how the land is beautiful, but the people in there are huge. They'll destroy us. They'll squash us. We shouldn't do this. We should go back to Egypt. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, go in and say, yeah, the people are huge, but listen, God is able. 
God is faithful. Both groups shared a story. One was a good report. One was a bad report. What was the difference? The good report provided hope and trust in Jesus. The bad report focused on just themselves. They provided grace as the center of the story. God's able. God's strong. He is faithful. He is good. No matter what we go through, he can provide a way out. No matter what our challenge is today, he can open a door. God is working. What kind of story are you sharing? You need to tell stories. You need to tell stories of grace, stories of hope. Some of you are good at telling how things, at how things are going in your life. The problem is everyone leaves around you miserable because all you do is talk about how bad things are and there's no talk about Jesus at all. It's a bad report. It's not filled with hope. It's not filled with grace. What kind of story are you sharing? Let me end. Go down all the way to the last verse of the passage. And it will be righteousness, righteousness for us if we are careful to do the commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. What's he talking about? If you obey me, if you do what I say, it will be righteousness to you. What does that mean? Were they able to do this? Absolutely not. They screwed up. They messed up. Even when they got into the promised land, everything Moses told them, they forgot. They wandered away from God over and over and over. Listen, the law is to push you to the conviction about every one of these things that I've talked about because we fail in all of them. You should feel the weight of that. You fail in every single one of them. He's teaching them to obey God's law, to obey God till they hit a wall, till they feel like they're miserable, till they feel like they can't do it. Obey till they realize they can't do it. I remember as a child, kept getting in trouble for the same thing over and over, and one day I just broke down crying in my room because after getting in trouble. And I remember my dad walking into the room and asked, why am I crying? Am I crying because I'm in trouble? Am I crying because I got caught? And I just told him, I said, no, I just, I want to do the right thing, but I can't. I keep failing. And I remember him saying, you can't. That's why you need Jesus. That's why you need him. All of these things that he calls us to do, we fail. And we fail miserably. Do you understand that everything that we talked about this morning is impossible for you to do on your own? Do you feel the weight to be faithful, the weight to be worshipful, the weight to be knowledgeable, the weight to be joyful, the weight to be available, the weight to be humble? You will not be able to walk out of here this morning and be able to do that on your own, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not. But here's the good news. There is a good report given in Scripture. God gives us this to drive us to himself. He takes the full responsibility to fulfill it upon his shoulders. He comes as a baby. His name was Jesus. Do you know what the name of Jesus means? God saves. God saves. He will be faithful to God in every facet of his life. He will obey God in every form. He will worship God and do whatever God tells him to do. Even though he will wrestle with God in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he will still trust God. Even though he agonized over his upcoming suffering, he would do it for the joy that was set before him. He suffered with tears and joy at the same time on the cross. He was agonized. He was broken. He was crying. And yet deep down he was joyful because he knew he would rescue us from our mess. He made himself available. He made himself a public, public spectacle of the wrath of God being poured out on him because of you and because of me. He will be publicly beaten, publicly mocked, stripped naked and crucified for the entire world to see. He made himself who knew no sin to become sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. Here's where it connects. God says if you do these things, you'll be righteous. But we realize that we can never do it. We fail, we'll never be righteous. And he says, okay, I'll take the burden on myself. And when he 
sends his son Jesus to die. It's no longer about what we do, but it's about his son Jesus. And because he dies, because he takes the punishment upon himself, God now declares us something that we would never be declared. He declares us righteous. This is how we leave a legacy. We don't leave, we don't live for righteousness. We live because of righteousness. We don't live to be made right with God. We live because we have been made right with God. We don't live so that we can be loved by God. We live because we have been loved by God. We live because of what Jesus has done. And now we want to obey him and do what he says. We leave a legacy for Jesus because we see the legacy that he himself has left behind for us. And he's our example. This morning we come to the table. And we don't come with anything in and of ourselves to boast about. We come knowing that we are complete failures. We're not faithful. We're not worshipers. We're not knowledgeable. We're not joyful. We're not available. We're not humble. And in our mess, God sends Jesus and says, everything you're supposed to be, I will show you what it's supposed to be like in Jesus. I will let him live the perfect life but then I will let him die the death that you're supposed to die. I will let him suffer the suffering that you're supposed to suffer. I will put on him the punishment that you are supposed to receive. And when I should have turned my face away from you, I'll do that to Jesus. I'll turn my face away from him. And when it's all said and done, when you come to the end of yourself and you fall to your knees in front of the cross, I will declare you righteous. I will declare you my son, my daughter, because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. This morning I'll ask you to examine your hearts, examine your lives, Examine your affections. Examine your attitudes. If you are trying to do this on your own, would you repent? Would you confess? Would you come to the table broken? Would you come to the table complete humility? Would you come recognizing, God, I can't do this. I can't leave a good name for myself, let alone for the generation that goes beyond behind me. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. This morning as you examine your hearts, whenever you are ready to come, I invite you to come, grab the elements and go back to your seat, and then we'll come and take the elements together. Let's worship.